Hi, I'm Katie Burtwell of the Walpole Historical Commission with another episode of Stories of Historic Walpole. Today's film is all about the hurricane of 1938 and its impact on our town. You know, today, whenever a hurricane spins off the west coast of Africa and heads our way, we know about it at least five or six days in advance. We've got weather satellites, and when it gets big enough, they send in the Hurricane Hunter planes to analyze its workings. And of course, on TV, we've got hordes of meteorologists analyzing every sp spaghetti model in the greatest detail. And what do we do? Well, we learned our lesson well in 1978 with the blizzard, so no matter what kind of storm is forecast, we go to Stop and Shop or we go to the Big Y, we bring in our lawn chairs and our potted plants, and we fill up our cars with gas so that when the time comes, we know when to evacuate and, and how to stay out of harm's way. And that is how we survive hurricanes today. But what if you didn't know it was coming? In 1938 Walpole, no satellites appeared in the night skies. Sputnik wouldn't be launched until 1957. There wouldn't be practical use for radar until after World War II, which was yet in the future. There was no t TV, of course, and the National Weather Bureau functioned without what we would consider any modern qu equipment at all. So when the most powerful hurricane since the great gale of 1815 hit New England, it did so without warning, and it killed 682 people. What was it like in Walpole shortly before the hurricane hit? Well, for news, people listened to the radio, and they read the Boston papers, and there was quite a few of them at the time. And of course, everybody read the Walpole Times. Many people worked at whatever jobs were available at Bird or Fales, Ke Kendall, Hollingsworth, and Vose. Um, if you had a job, you were lucky. If anyone in your household was working, you were lucky. It was still the Great Depression. Times were hard. Sacrifice was commonplace. Folks were also very worried about war breaking out in Europe as Hitler rose to prominence. If you had a little money, you could do quite well shopping at Walpole's Main Street businesses. First National offered an eight ounce box of macaroni for a nickel. Hartson's Market sold six pounds of Baldwin apples for a quarter. Now, if you really wanted to celebrate you could go to the Red Wing at the same location where it is today and enjoy fried clams with tartar sauce, coleslaw, french fries in a roll, and butter for 35 cents. Of course, that was a lot of money then, and a lot of people didn't have it. So the Boston stores, they offered all sorts of wonderful things. But many such possessions were beyond the means of most people. It just made better sense to make do with what you already had. September 1938 arrived in Walpole with the kids back in school and families settling down to the usual routine. Now down south, the National Weather Bureau had been tracking a hurricane off the coast of Florida but it appeared to veer out to sea. However, unbeknownst to anyone, the jet stream, which is a high current 
of wind that goes through the stratosphere. It had dipped down and it pulled the storm up the Atlantic coast at 60 miles an hour. The great hurricane of 38 first hit New York, killing many on the Long Island coastline. It made a second landfall in Connecticut, flooding cities and destroying beach towns. Then it crossed onto the southern shores of Rhode Island. People were still in their beach houses when a storm surge up to 30 feet high swept them away. This wall of seawater then raced up Narragansett Bay to Providence, killing more and flooding the entire downtown to a depth of 14 feet. The storm then crossed into southeastern Massachusetts. The observer on duty at the Blue Hill Observatory recorded sustained winds of 121 miles an hour and a gust of 186 miles an hour, the highest ever recorded here. All the windows of the observatory blew in on him. Because Walpole was inland, the storm surge was far away. However, torrential rain and hurricane winds pushed the Neponset over its banks and into the factories that depended on it. Hollingsworth and Vos, Bird and Kendall were swamped with dirty water that soaked their goods and ruined their equipment. Over 10,000 trees in Walpole fell, one killing the 76-year-old sister-in-law of Charles Sumner Bird. Mrs. Marion Childs lost her life when a tree smashed onto the car in which she was a passenger. The Walpole Times provided coverage of these chilling events some days later, reporting that the rear wall and part of the roof of the Pierce Bus Lines garage was blown off. A plate glass window in Spears Hardware was shattered. Part of the roof of the multi plant on South Street left its moorings and flew away. The garage at the Kendall Company was damaged, and part of the roof of the Curity Mill was torn off by the gale. Small windows were blown out, roofs were lifted, shingles were scattered, and hardly a house in town escaped some damage. Even the venerable old Deacon Willard Lewis house suffered damage from a fallen tree. The selectmen declared an emergency, arranging increased fire and police protection. The Walpole Times informed its readers that the fury of the storm can best be told by the fact that all Wednesday night Walpole was marooned with every road into town block. East Walpole was very hard hit. A wing of the home of Ralph Ferris on East Street was demolished when a large elm tree fell on the house. The Baranowski house on Washington Street was badly demolished by a falling tree, while a garage belonging to Patrick Sullivan of East Street and a hen house at the Keller Farm were blown from their moorings and reduced to kindling. At Bird, garages were demolished and many cars were damaged. Air ventilators on the Hollingsworth and Vos mills were blown off. In the center of town, the most spectacular damage was suffered by the Orthodox Congregational Church on East Street and the Unitarian Church on Common Street. The steeples were blown off both buildings. On South Street, the Norfolk Waste Paper Company lost part of its fourth story, the debris piling up in the street and blocking traffic. The employees escaped about three minutes before the roof fell. This is the same building that would burn to the ground in 1957 and I'll tell you that story in a future episode. 
One severe injury was suffered by Howard L. Boyden of Washington Street, a painter who fell from a ladder as he was painting early in the afternoon as the gale started. He was taken to Norwood Hospital. Now, you're probably wondering, like I did, why Mr. Boyden was trying to paint in a hurricane. But then again, he didn't know it was a hurricane, and neither did anybody else. And I suspected that he most likely needed the money his work would earn and took a chance even as the wind strengthened and the sky darkened. After the hurricane passed, power was out. The phones were out. It churned its way through northern New England and into Canada. For the next few nights, the wind was still, the damage all over town, indeed all over New England, illuminated by a bright September moon. It took a number of days for New Englanders to understand what had happened. The Boston papers reported an increasingly large fatality count as more and more bodies were discovered on the beaches or in the rubble. In Walpole, recovery was on everyone's mind. Boston Edison went into action, replacing SNAP power lines. The telephone company did its best to restore service. The Department of Public Works began hiring WPA workers to grab hand saws and travel around town in trucks to cut and haul away thousands of downed trees. Mr. Herb Lewis headed up the effort to place all these fallen trees into Cobb's Pond, where they would be floated until they could be used. I was just told by members of the Historical Society that Cobb's Pond had only been created a couple of years before the hurricane. It was sort of a marshy, squishy meadow, and the people that owned it thought it was of no use at all. So they diverted a stream, flooded it, filled it full of fish, and the Fish and Game Club members got to come down and fish. But in 1938, after the storm, there would not be no fishing at Cobb's Pond. Walpole resident Walter Barnes recalled building himself a sawmill and then a house, stating that all the framing timber in it was hurricane timber. While folks were planing trees for lumber, the Commonwealth warned everyone to stay out of the woods to prevent fires. No fire engines would have been able to reach places where the deadfalls obstructed all paths in and out. When the bulk of the mess was cleaned up, the phones and the electricity operative and the trees hauled away, folks realized that some of Walpole's oldest buildings could not be saved. Whiting Smith's Drumhead Tannery over on North Street was one of them. This concern had once provided the highest quality drum heads available to the Union Army during the Civil War. Now the old structure was smashed. Its lumber was hauled away and no doubt reused somewhere else. I have an interesting story about the thrifty recycling of another of Walpole's damaged buildings. After the hurricane, the damaged Orthodox Congregational Church on E Street was sold to florist Joe Gallo and his wife. And if you've been in town for some time, you will remember Gallo's florist. And that was the spot where the church once stood. Now, when it was time to take the church down, the story is that he let his it fellow Italian-American friends know that Wood was available. Gennaro Pascucci, who had bought a house on Lake Avenue in 1937, asked his friend Sam LaRusso to take his truck over 
and bring back as much lumber as he could. He did so, and Mr. Pascucci, my husband's grandpa, built himself a garage. So I guess that you could say that the Orthodox Congregational Church lives on in my backyard. Occasionally, someone in a community ends up doing something extraordinary without even meaning to. This is the case with Mr. Roderick Bruce, who lived at 793 East Street. On July 10, 1938, Mr. Bruce took his camera and he went around town taking pictures here and there, and he came up with a pretty good set of photos showing areas that in just two months' time would be decimated by the hurricane of 1938. After it hit, he went back and re-photographed the locations he had shot in July and more as well. Then he did us the courtesy of donating his pictures to the Walpole Historical Society. So let's take a look at Mr. Bruce's wonderful photos of Walpole before and after the Great Blow. In July 1938, Mr. Bruce went to the top of the clock tower of the old townhouse and took pictures of downtown facing south. Here we see Main Street and West Street, with the common dividing the two as it does. To your right, you can see the future Herb Lewis building, and right across Elm Street, you can see the now demolished Runnels Hartson House. Now stay on that same side of the street because you can see the smokestack of Kendall Mills. And now if you go across the street, you will see a white bulge across from Kendall above the skyline that is Powderhouse Hill. It's gone today, taken down over the years by the LaRussos for the sand and gravel it contained. In its place are the Swan Pond condos. So here we are, back on the ground after the storm, at the same intersection of Main and West Streets, looking at what happened to those stately trees that once graced the town common. Again, you can see the future Herb Lewis building and Elm Street to your right. Next, we see the Robbins farmhouses that once stood on, you guessed it, Robbins Road. You can see the big Asker, a glacial hill full of sand that has partially survived, despite most of it being torn down for the Johnson Middle School ball fields. This picture was taken on July 10th, 1938. And this was taken after the September hurricane. The trees have been torn apart, but surprisingly, the houses were damaged, but intact. After the hurricane, these homes were used as homes for wayward girls. But eventually, except for one house that still stands on Robbins Road, they would be torn down to accommodate the construction of the VFW and the veterans housing that was built there in 1949. As for poor old Robbins Road, here's what it looked like several weeks after the hurricane hit Walpole. Nobody was in a rush to clear it because it was just a privately owned dirt path instead of a formal town road. The churches in town didn't fare any better. First, here is a picture that Mr. Bruce took from the top of the old townhouse looking toward Norwood that shows the old Orthodox Congregational Church to your right. Do you see the white steeple? This is the church after the hurricane. The building had already been closed to the public because it had been struck by lightning the year before, but the big blow finished it off. The steeple was a goner as well. 
Another church on Common Street, one that would be rehabilitated and opened in 1940 as the United Church, also lost its steeple. There are stories that some of our less scrupulous citizens tried to steal the copper off these down steeples, but were stopped by the Walpole PD. We mentioned Pierce's bus garage already, and here it is, damaged by the winds. This is a crippled Meltzer Allen house. Mr. Bruce doesn't tell us which one. There were many because Meltzer Allen built a lot of houses in Walpole. These tilted telephone poles along the railroad tracks tell their own story. The hurricane of 1938 changed New England forever. Over a billion trees were destroyed, and most of the wood would be used in World War II, which unfortunately was just around the corner. And let us not forget the nearly 700 lives that were lost. These people were killed by a storm they couldn't see coming. Hundreds of old houses were pounded into kindling. In Walpole, folks cleaned up the mess, reused what they could, mourned the dead and tended the injured, and hoped that Mother Nature would hold off on any more cruel surprises. Since then, we've experienced the hurricane of 1944, Hurricanes Carol and Edna 10 days apart in 1954, the rain from Hurricane Diane in 1955, Hurricane Gloria in 1985, and Bob in 1991. None have rivaled what Walpole citizens saw and survived with grace in 1938. This is Katie Burtwell from the Walpole Historical Commission. Happy you're joining us as we count down to the 300th anniversary of the friendly town. Keep watching.